Welcome to the LSU Sports Insider, brought to you by the journalists at The Advocate, NOLA.com, and the Times Picayune. Here in Keys, hanging out here with you on an Easter Sunday. I'm in the top left box, Reed Darcy in the top right box. Happy Easter to you two uh, fine gentlemen, Reed Darcy and Scott Rabelais. How are you guys doing? How is Albany? We're doing well. Uh, happy Easter to uh, you and all our viewers here. Um, didn't think I'd be in Albany, New York for Easter necessarily. Wasn't on the bucket oh, list, but but here we are, and it's some some great basketball going on. Oh, the places you'll go, uh, I, I'm, Reed. You'll you'll see this is uh, for you know for as long as your career goes, you'll find yourself sitting in a sitting on a hotel bed somewhere on Christmas night because there's some football game going on the next day or whatever it is. So uh, it's a <laughs> it's a fine journey we're all on here. Uh, we appreciate everybody tuning in. Uh, we are yeah, after, we're coming to you. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Reed. There's a real, real lack of crawfish up here. I mean, he's missing out. So kind of disappointing. But we get we get to watch the basketball, so it's not a bad trade off. That's right. That's right. And life is a series of trade offs. So uh, as Kim Mulkey and the LSU Tigers can probably tell you right about now, uh, we are uh, we are coming to you. As I said, Happy Easter to everybody. To all those who celebrate, we are coming to you. Uh, on Sunday, uh, Sunday afternoon, uh, LSU, of course, has defeated UCLA in a Sweet 16 to move on to uh, a rematch in the Elite Eight with Iowa, a rematch of last year's national championship game, which LSU, of course, won uh, 102 to 85. Uh, and it's going to be quite the show, and it's been quite the show already. Uh, before we uh, get into it, let's get into a little bit of business, of course, as always. Uh, typically, we uh, we come to you on the LSU Sports Insider every Monday and Thursday. We decided to get uh, get out a little bit in front of this game, of course, uh, and give uh, give this show a little bit longer shelf life and uh, give the people what they want, which, which is a, a, a whole lot more discussion about the day that was on Saturday and the day that's to come on Monday night. So uh, we are here, as I said, again, typically every Monday and Thursday, but we're coming to you live here on Sunday. Uh, and we are always live. We're always coming to you live when we do on all our social channels, but specifically our YouTube channel, uh, LSU Tigers on NOLA.com, if you search YouTube for that. Uh, and you can subscribe, and that way you can catch us live uh, each time. And if you don't catch us live, you can catch us uh, after the fact on that same YouTube channel, LSU Tigers at NOLA.com. If you don't catch us there, you can catch us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever the finer podcasts are found. And, of course, these fine gentlemen are uh, hanging out in uh, what looks like a mall but is actually an arena. Uh, it's actually the MVP Arena in Albany, New York, on Sunday, on Easter Sunday, uh, bringing you the best LSU sports coverage, as the advocate always does. So please support your local journalist, uh, crawfish less journalists uh, who are up there in Albany, uh, roughing it. Uh, please support them and uh, go to theadvocate.com and subscribe uh, there. You can go to theadvocate.com slash subscribe to join us and join all the fun. Don't miss a moment of everything that is coming down the line. And at LSU, there is always something coming down the line. Uh, plenty of sports going on. Obviously, the uh, the spotlight is front and center on the LSU women. So, uh, but please don't miss uh, anything else. You can get all the, all the headlines, all the LSU headlines delivered straight to your inbox with the LSU newsletter. Uh, to sign up for that, you go to theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. And as always, we are brought to you uh, today and every day by Champion Wealth Strategies. Champion Wealth Strategies is a national financial services firm specializing in the markets of securities, 401ks, and college and retirement planning. Uh, our broker dealer is LPL, financial member FINRA, SIPC. As you know, uh, bank in uh, investments are not guaranteed, uh, not guaranteed by the FDIC and may lose value. But, uh, but to find out more about Champion Wealth Strategies, please go to championwealthstrategies.com and plan like a champion today. Okay, with all that out of the way, uh, Rav, we're, we have entered into yet another weekend for the ages. I know we keep on saying this, but I mean, my goodness, when is something interesting going to happen on the LSU beat? I'm just, it's, it's, I'm just amazed uh, that it's, it's, so, it's so quiet, stress-free, news-free, controversy-free, all that stuff. I, in all seriousness, Rav, I was just going to ask you if you could walk us through Saturday from start to finish, uh, starting with the long-awaited Washington Post story that that uh, right. they published by Kent Babb, and go from there. Right. So Saturday morning, the long-awaited Washington Post Post's in-depth story on Kent Mulkey finally hit their website. Uh, delayed 
we have to we have to every indication it was delayed from when they originally planned to publish it. We I think Wilson Alexander told us he heard from a, a reporter of theirs that it was supposed to go on Tuesday, and then it, it was delayed until Saturday morning. Uh, clearly, they were looking through it very closely. Finally publishes. Uh, we're reading it. Uh, Reed's reading it. I'm driving the car on the way to the arena for the game, and uh, didn't see any enormous revelations in it. So uh, uh, you know, heard that you know Mulkey says she hasn't read it, but we heard she wasn't up. She wasn't uh, what she got from it or what she was told about it. She wasn't upset about it. So that seemed to be like a storm that was passing. And then uh, we had the uh, the game, which was uh, an intense fight for the most part. Somewhat chippy affair between LSU and UCLA, which the Tigers won 78-69. Then we get in the post game and uh, hear this all this talk about this uh, story in the Los Angeles Times by a uh, writer named Ben Bolch, who is the UCLA beat writer, but wrote a commentary describing LSU as dirty debutantes and UCLA as America's sweethearts and the game being a battle of good versus evil. This was a story that was published Friday, but a lot of us here in Albany didn't see anything of until... Saturday, uh, right around the game or right after the game. So Kim Mulkey came out blasting that. It's kind of like the Washington Post story was set aside, and and uh, she came out blasting that and blasting you know, the the implications of the, of uh, what the writers said about her her players. Um, you know, this morning, uh, finally, Los Angeles Times has Times has removed the you could say offending paragraph that uh, described LSU as dirty debutantes, uh, and uh, but the story is still up, and uh, the UCLA coach. Uh, Corey Close had uh, tweeted a link to the, the story, and she issued an apology about it late last night. And then it's just, uh, here's the game now. LSU's playing the most uh, anticipated game in you know, certainly regional final, probably in the NCAA tournament history against Iowa, who they beat last year. So, as you said, nothing much going on here. Nothing more to see here. <laughs> uh, Reed, Reed uh, before the mics got hot, as we say, Reed uh, said he got he got a great night's sleep last night because uh, I'm sure you guys got to sort of run through the woodshed. Not that we're you know working offshore or coal mining here, but uh, right. it, it was a long day from start to finish. Uh, Reed, I, I, I want to get into uh, you know you've been covering this team from start to finish. You were there last year for the national championship game. I just want to sort of I, I want to get your your two cents on you know let's not let's not lose the forest for the trees let's we, we saw some pretty elite level basketball uh on saturday between lsu and ucla and it struck me i tweeted this out after the game it struck me that lsu's trainers are going to have uh, quite a quite a hefty lift uh for the next 36 hours between saturday's game and monday's game because this looked like it for every look for everything on tv uh, you guys are obviously there in the arena. It looked for everything on TV like this was a knockdown, drag out, heavyweight fight in in the in in the best way. Uh, I don't mean that in terms of you know dirty play and foul play and that kind of thing, but uh, it, it was it was a thriller from start to finish, and it looked like it probably took a lot out of both teams. Yeah, it was very physical, and, and, and I think um, you you look at forty five fouls combined between both teams. LSU, I believe, had four players with at least three fouls. UCLA had six players with at least three fouls. Um, two players fouled out, Angel Reese fouled out, Kiki Rice fouled out. So it's a very physical game. It, it sort of reminded me of the two games that LSU played against Auburn um, earlier in the season. Auburn's a really physical team, and they really took it to LSU, and they tried to beat them up um, as, as much as they could in, in those two games. And, and you know, we, we talked to Angel Reese and uh, Anissa Morrow and Leah Del Rosario after the game, and they said, yeah, um, they, they could feel the physical physicality, and they could feel you know the, the effort you know UCLA was playing with. Um, but it's something that they were used to. It's nothing that they haven't felt before. Um, so they so they were able to prevail. They were able to come through. Um, and I think the story of this game is how they how they shot at the free throw line. You know, they once again, you know, the third for the third game in a row in the tournament, they had a large discrepancy from the free throw line um, over, over their postseason opponent. And I think I think that's incredibly telling because you know this LSU team is built to get free throws and they're built to wear teams down in, in that regard and, and they've been able to do that consistently throughout the tournament and so it, it, it might it might you know be something else to watch when they play Iowa tomorrow you know how often do they get to the free throw line and how does that help them um, sustain their offense because Iowa's a bit of an undersized team so maybe they'll they'll have an even extra added emphasis you know getting to the free throw line so so yeah, that's that's their bread and butter, you know, free throws and fast break points, and, and that's how they can win. In a big in a big game, in a heavyweight fight such as this one, uh, it sure helps to have your best players play at their best. 
Angel Reese and Flaw J. Johnson played at their best. Reed, I was just going to ask you uh, just how, you know, I know Flaw J said that this was not the greatest game she's ever played, but uh, for everything, it sure looked like uh, it sure looked like an extension of what we've seen out of Flaw J over the past, I don't know, five, six, seven, ten games where she's being that much more assertive and that that much better a basketball player, frankly. Just how dominant, how dominant is the wrong word, but just how clutch was Flaw J. Johnson here and with her basketball skills? Yeah, she, she won't say it, but I, but I will. I think that was the best game I've seen her play in an LSU uniform. Um, you know, when you think back, you sort of look at her first game in the SEC tournament against Auburn. Um, she had 23 points or something like that, I believe. So she had another great game there. Yeah, but like you said, this has sort of been building for a while. She's, she's been playing really well, um, especially in the last month or so of the season. And what really jumped out at me is the, the play she made defensively, right? She had two blocks and a steal. Um, and it was sort of in the last minute after she made that layup underneath the you know, contest from Lauren Betts. After that, she blocked Betts on the other end. She sort of poked her shot from behind and, and got the steal. And how, So that was crazy. And how – and how tall how tall is Lauren Betts, just in case everybody forgets? Lauren Betts is six foot seven. Flage is like five nine, five ten. You know, so she really got up there to block that shot. It was super impressive. We had a great angle out on it. Um, she you know poked it away right from behind. And so that was you know that was almost even more impressive than the layup she made. So the, but the layup she made, you know, that was really what sealed the deal for LSU. You know, she got that offensive rebound. She took it out. She glanced at the shot clock, and then she made a quick move to the rim and really a scooping layup underneath Lauren Betts, and that's what we've seen from her all year. She's one of the best finishers in the country. She's really good at contorting herself and it, when she's in midair to, you know, finish at awkward angles. It's what she does. It's it's really the strength of her game, and she's really improved her confidence, you know, attacking off the dribble um, or, or between her freshman year to her sophomore year. Scott Rabelais, you've seen uh, the you, – you were there to witness the emergence of the LSU women's basketball program and now the reemergence of the LSU women's basketball program. In terms of postseason play and clutch play, uh, I would have to think that you would agree that Flaw J's performance is right up there with the best of them. Oh, right up there, certainly. I, I, I will still say the best game I've ever seen against a quality opponent at LSU play was Sylvia Fowles in the 2007 Elite Eight game against UConn. She totally dominated UConn, and LSU won that game going away. And and, Flo, and, and Sylvia Fowles is going to be in the Hall of Fame one day. So, you know, that maybe that's not the fairest comparison. But Flojie, uh, I agree with Reed said, certainly the best game of her college career, especially considering the circumstances, 24 points, 12 rebounds, a couple of blocks, an assist, a couple of turnovers, but nothing bad, hit their, hit their only two three-pointers. And we've just really seen her blossom. And she's been playing well lately. She, uh, she's had eight straight games in double figures. But 14 points against Rice, 21 points against Middle Tennessee, and now the, this 24-point effort against the, obviously the best team that they played in the tournament so far. And I, I you know, what what is it? What is it about Flaugia? You know, we saw her with flashes last year, and I was talking to Bob Starkey, the LSU's lead assistant, after the game last night. And he said she finally gets it. And Flaugia will say this too: she finally gets it. She finally is you know really understanding the game and not just relying just on pure talent to make plays. And uh, she she's you know, become a student of the game, studying a lot of film, and uh, becoming a much more consistent player. And I, I tell you, if Angel Reese departs LSU after this season, after a lot of people, uh, like a lot of people think she will, I, I think we might be saying going into next year, this is Flaw J. Johnson's team. Oh, without a doubt. It's, it'll be Flaw J. In terms of just pure scoring, it'll be Flaw J. and Michaela, but I don't think they're, I don't think anybody would, certainly at this point, would contest the notion that it would be Flaw J. In terms, in terms of whether she's actually the team captain or not, she's the one who's driving the bus. And, and she's often and the emotional leader. Now. Right. right. She's often the emotional leader of this team as well. She plays with a lot of passion, a lot of, a lot of fire, a lot of spirit, a lot of joy for the game. You know, Kim Mulkey spoke about that this morning at the press conference we had uh, to preview the Iowa game. Just plays with a lot of, a lot of joy. And uh, you, 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 know what, you know what's going on with Flaugé. And, and, and it's, uh, she's got a lot of reason to be happy with the way she's playing and obviously the way her team is playing right now for sure. Uh, Reed Darcy, this game, again, was uh, it was something of a heavyweight fight, but let's not uh, gloss over the notion that uh, LSU, excuse me, LSU, uh, UCLA took a lot of three-point shots and missed a lot of three-point shots, and um, Iowa is just flat out not going to miss that many. UCLA finished seven for 32. I don't have it in front of me, but I think uh, they were something like two for nine in the first half and three point shooting and probably started off even a little bit worse than that UCLA. Uh, what, what, 
how what was the you know how did that how did that come to be and what would LSU what will LSU have to do on Monday night against one of the uh, better outside scoring teams that we've ever seen? I think they're just missing shots. I don't think it was just anything that LSU did special defensively. You know, they got they sort of got a bunch of good looks. You know, they got the looks that they wanted and they just missed. And that's sometimes the way it works. You know, teams like that you live and die by the three ball. You know, it's not anything anything revelatory. It's not anything specific that LSU did. I think. Um, you saw they just missed their shots. You know, I think they started two of 17, I believe, in the first half. Um, right. Then they started to heat up a little bit in the third quarter, and that's really what keyed them um, in order to make it a close game in the second half. But then they cooled off again, and Flasher took over, and Lush's offense, um, you know, found, found a rhythm again. But like I said, you know, live and die by the three. You know, they, they fell into a 10-point hole in the first half because they missed a bunch of threes, and then they climbed out of it because they made a bunch of threes. And that was really the story of the game, um, in my opinion. So... You know, when you look at Iowa, again, like you said, they're one of the best uh, three-point shooting teams in the country, and that's not just including Caitlin Clark. They've got a lot of other players who can shoot really well as well. And so that, that they, if I'm LSU, that, that's something that's concerning because some of their post players can actually step outside beyond the arc and shoot. Um, and, and that could be tricky for Angel and Anissa because they're they're so good around the glass, they're, they're so good at grabbing rebounds that if they're having to go out beyond the three-point arc on defense, then that could limit some of the rebounds they can get. Um, which is bad news for LSU because they really, really try to emphasize grabbing rebounds and they really try to make it a part of their identity. Um, so just watch exactly what Iowa does to space the floor and to bring Angel and Misa out on the perimeter. I think if they can do that and, you know, shoot efficiently from beyond the arc, then they can probably beat LSU. But LSU does have the size advantage inside over Iowa, so they can get um, probably most of what they want on, on, on their offensive end of the floor. So it'll, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see how they, how they match up there. Right. Go ahead, Red. You know, I'm probably people, a lot of people think, what is the secret to Kim Mulkey's success? Why do her teams win so much? Why have they won nine straight games in the NCAA tournament? She focuses on playing defense, focuses on rebounding, and they don't rely on the two-pointer. And they, they focus on getting to the, uh, to the free throw line, as Reed talked about from the first game, 24 of 31 yesterday. It's not a huge secret. It's, it's just doing the fundamental things really well. And to my way of thinking, this is a way to win a lot of basketball games. I know Alabama's men rely on a lot of three-pointers, and they're in the Final Four for the first time. But I think they're going to have a hard time beating UConn. I think winning six straight games with that style is difficult. I think winning six straight games with Iowa style is difficult. And so I, I, think, uh, I, I think because LSU has that size advantage, it, it, yeah, they, they benefited from UCLA not just missing a lot of three-pointers yesterday, but just – barely throwing the rim and just missing, shooting air balls. There were a lot of the shots that were just dreadful. But they benefited from that. But but in general, you know, maybe LSU's defense had a little to do with that. And their defense is much better than it was earlier in the season. I think if they'll, you know, Colorado, they got they got wiped out by Iowa yesterday by 21 points. If it was LSU and Colorado uh, in this regional final, I think LSU would have been very happy to see Colorado again in a, in a rematch with the, with a trip to the Final Four on the line. But, that, but that's what makes Kim Mulkey's team consistently winning defense, rebounding, going to the free throw line. If you can do those things consistently, you're going to win a lot of games. That's what her teams do, and that's why they're in the Elite Eight for the second straight year. Uh, you guys uh, uh, just finished up a press conference uh, this morning, Sunday morning, uh, with LSU and Iowa and Kim Mulkey and the crew. Uh, and I, I found it illuminating that uh, Kim Mulkey made a point to say our game plan is not going to be the same game plan that we followed against Iowa last year. And, you know, a lot of it makes sense. There's no, there's no Jasmine Carson who incidentally finished that game with the game high 22 points. It's sort of easy to forget that. Uh, six threes in the first half, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, certainly no Alexis Morris to take over the game in the fourth quarter. No Ladeja Williams to come up with a clutch, uh, a clutch performance, especially if uh, some of your other bigs get into foul trouble. What do you expect? And I'll leave this uh, with you, Reed, to, to start off. What do you expect to see in terms of what LSU might try to do offensively? You discussed defensively what they got to do, uh, but offensively, how, how might they attack this particular Iowa team, which is different as well? Yeah, I think I think when Mulkey said that, she was more referring to their offensive game plan. Not having yeah. Alexa, Jasmine, and Ladeisha um, is big because those three combined for 63 points last year in the title game, and they don't have any of them. They don't have all, all three of them. They're they're all um, off to their careers. So you know, it's 
it, it'll be interesting. I think, you know, the offense might look different, but, but the defensive game plan is probably going to stay the same. What they really tried to do last year was um, they, they sort of let Caitlin Clark get hers. They let her shoot from the three. They they really didn't – they didn't try – they wanted to look prevent her from driving the lane and, and penetrating. Um, but, but, but they sort of let her sh- shoot threes and said, hey, if she gets 30, she's going to get 30. There's not much we can do about it. I think Angel said today, you know, she gets 30 in wins and she gets 30 in losses. Um, so no matter what LSU does, no matter what LSU, how LSU defends her, Caitlin Clark's probably going to have a big game if she's that good. You know, that's what she does to teams, and that's what she has done all season in her entire career. Um, so it'll be more about how LSU um, defends the role players and, and the other five or six players around Caitlin Clark. Um, last year, they really tried to key in on Monica Sonano, um, their, their post player who had a great season last year. Um, she wasn't very good in the national title game, and you can think um, Daisha Williams for that because she really did a great job shutting her down. Um, now Iowa, they don't have they don't have Monica Sinano, but they do have a, a pretty good complement of role players. And Mulkey was very complimentary of how how well they shot the three ball. Um, so LSU is going to have to defend the three in Iowa, and they're not going to have to. They can't let those role players get open space from, from there because they're going to they can easily make make LSU pay for giving them open space. Uh, these. Uh, it- if you would just expand on that a little bit, Reed, in terms of uh, I was not quite as big as it was last year, and certainly LSU, unlike the UCLA game, LSU should have a size advantage inside. Yeah, their, their biggest player is Hannah Skolke. Uh, I believe she's like 6'2", 6'3", but she's like a, a shorter 6'2", 6'3", if, I, if that makes any sense. Angel Reese. Yeah, she can go outside a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Angel Reese was at the size advantage, disadvantage to Lauren Betts, right? But Angel Reese now has the size advantage um, against Iowa and against um, Hannah Stolke. Um, so, so Angel, she's just a lot longer and she's a lot taller. Um, and I think Iowa could really have a lot of trouble with Angel around the rim. You know, I think they, they'll really have a, a lot of trouble keeping her off the free throw line, keeping her off the offensive glass, um, and preventing her from getting open layups. So I think Iowa, you know, they, they might really struggle to defend Angel Reese. We've been waiting for Angel Reese to have a huge game in the tournament to shoot really efficiently. Um, I think that could come tomorrow night um, because Iowa just doesn't have the size to match up with her. Um, so, so I'll be I'll be looking out for that as well. LSU second in the nation behind UCLA, incidentally, in rebounding margin. LSU is plus twelve point seven. Iowa is I can't count this this quickly, but uh, Iowa is a good ways down the list, for somewhere in the top twenty, but you know toward the bottom of the top twenty, plus seven point six rebounding margin. Uh, Rab, uh, uh, this is, I bring this up not because we're trying to stir the pot, which we are occasionally accused of doing. It might be guilty of, but uh, no, I, I bring this up because I think it's legit because we've seen this over and over and over again, uh, that this has potential to be certainly a physical game. We expect that. But uh, do you expect to get chippy? Well, it, you'd have to expect that considering – Everyone remembers the image from the championship game last year of Angel Reese walking past Caitlin Clark and pointing to her ring finger. And let us not forget uh, Caitlin Clark in the Elite Eight game last year against Louisville, waving a hand in, in, uh, in, uh, towards Haley Van Lift like you can't see me when Haley Van Lift was playing for, for Louisville. So, uh, so, you know, it cuts both ways. And I think a lot of the focus is on what LSU does and what, what they do. And Caitlin Clark sometimes gets a pass with, with some, of, some of her similarities. But, yes. I would expect it to get a little chippy. Like Iowa wants to beat LSU. They, the LSU took them out last year in the championship game. They they know, and Caitlin Clark knows. You know, people are saying she could be the best player, considered the best player in the history of women's basketball, if she wins a national championship. And this mm-hmm. is her last shot. And so LSU standing in their way. LSU stood in their way last year, and LSU's had to hear all the all the Caitlin Clark hype for a year as well. And and frankly, some of that hype is. She's the golden child, and LSU's the, for lack of a better term, bad girls of women's basketball, as we've seen the people villains. write. As we've good seen, villains. The, villains. As, the, yes. the good villains, as Angel said. Yeah, the good, the good villains. And they've, they've certainly embraced that role, but I think they're using it as an edge. Both teams, obviously, I always got an edge. They want revenge uh, from last year's game. And LSU's got an edge that I, I think you know, they can certainly play the everyone's against us card and, and uh, take that to heart. So. Yeah, I expect it's going to get. Uh, I expect it's going to be like that, and if it does, it does. Uh, I, you know, I think people need to get over a little bit of. I'm, I'm not a big person for trash talking and and stuff like that, but at the same time, people need to get over that the fact that women 
can't be as competitive as Ben do and, and, and that, that they can't be accepted to, to do some of the things that the men do in, in, a, in a heated competition. So I, I, but I, I certainly expect we're going to see some of that tomorrow for sure. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me, given, first of all, given how we saw last year's game, but also given how it seems to have been uh, for much of this tournament, that we're going to see it possibly be, possibly because of that potential influence uh, that the refs are going to call it a tight game that can work. Uh, that can work both ways for LSU. Obviously Reed, you mentioned LSU is built to get to the free throw line and the discrepancies between free throws between LSU and its opponents this postseason has been noticeable leading to many people, you know, running the tinfoil hat conspiracy theories as well. Nonetheless, LSU is built to get to the free throw line. That certainly can be a benefit to them. But LSU, is, as we've said over and over and over again this year, seven players deep, and that's about it. And uh, they were sort of living on the edge against uh, UCLA. They can't really uh, afford to have their players get into too much foul trouble. Can you just uh, sort of discuss that a little bit further? Yeah, no, that's something that Angel has really struggled with this tournament, I think, foul trouble. You know, there's been a lot of foul calls, um, you know, obviously in every game they've played. Um, but I mean, the free throw discrepancy, you know, I, I, you know, I've seen some, some people, you know, online say, oh, you know, LSU, of course, of course, they get a good whistle. You know, the ref, refs treat them, treat them too well. Um, but you know, their 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 opponents, especially Middle Tennessee and UCLA, they took a ton of threes. And when you take a ton of threes, um, you're not going to shoot a lot of free throws. Um, so that, that's probably the, the largest reason behind the discrepancy. You know, that's that's just the way Kim Mulkey wants them to play. And that's the way she built the team, and that's the way Angel Reese. Um, really wants to score most of her points. It's on the free throw line. And the Nisa Moro is the same way. Um, they, they're built to funnel all the offense uh, to the rim, you know, funnel it into the post, funnel it into the paint, um, and get layups and get free throws and get offensive rebounds. That's what they're built on. And, and that's what's going to carry them through the tournament. Um, Kim Mulkey, you know, thinks that you know, that can be consistent game to game to game. Whereas if, if, you're, if you're built on three-point shooting, that can be up and down. You can't really rely on that as consistently as you can um, layups and free throws and paint points. Um, so that, that that's really what they're trying to do. That, that's that's the recipe. Um, that's the plan for them to get back to the Final Four. And so whether they beat Iowa or whether whether they lose to Iowa, they're going to go down playing the way that they want to play. You know, that, that's the one thing we know for sure. Rab, what would you uh, would you do anything? Would you try to do anything different in terms of making sure uh, that LSU stays out of foul trouble? Uh you know, I, I, I don't know uh, how much they can do. They're going to play. They're going to try to f- play a physical game and impose a physical game on Iowa. So you're going to have to live with some fouls. And as Reed said, there's not much of a bench. They played seven players yesterday. They probably played seven players uh, in, in Monday's game. And, and you just have to be smart with it. You have to. Uh, you have to. You know, try to. But you, but you, they're on the edge sometimes. Yeah, Haley Van Lith took a, a charge that fouled Kiki Rice out of the game uh, yesterday. That um, could have gone the other way, but Kiki Rice has put out an put out an arm and, and gave her a shove, and, and that was the call. So uh, no, I, I think they're going to play that that uh, aggressive style, aggressive style, and uh, try to disrupt the game as much as they can with their defense and getting in the passing lanes and that sort of thing. So no, I would expect a similar approach to else you had against UCLA. One other thing uh, before uh, before we sort of start to wind this down. Uh, this is, Brad, you mentioned this. This may be the most anticipated regional final in, in the history of the, in, in the, excuse me, in the history of the NCAA Women's Tournament. Uh, the championship game last year drew 9.9 million viewers across ESPN platforms that easily outdistanced some of the biggest college football games of that season. I don't know that they will get to 9.9, uh, but this this has the potential to be maybe the most watched basketball game, women's basketball game this season, at least leading into the championship game. Uh, can, can they can they hit can they hit the over on 9.9, or is it going to go somewhere near there? I think it makes it a little tougher that it's on a Monday night instead of a yeah. Sunday. If if the game was today, maybe you know. But uh, I spoke to Rebecca Lobo after the game yesterday. She was uh, about to leave the court as I was heading to the press conferences, and uh, she's calling. She called the semifinals and is calling the game tomorrow. She she thought maybe reaching the last year's championship game number would be a bit of a stretch, but she said maybe seven million viewers would be uh, within possible. I think I, I have no idea. I'm not a TV person or in the Nielsen family or anything like that. But I think they they have a shot to get a very big number in this game. This is this is kind of like 
Imagine if Larry Bird and Magic Johnson had a rematch of the 1979 National Championship game the next year. You know, what, what kind of number would that have drawn for a college game? You know, they, played, they, they went on to play in the NBA, of course, many times, but in the college game. What would that have been like? I think it, I think these two uh, teams and these two star players are kind of in that vein, and uh, I, yeah, I think uh, I think a lot of folks are going to be turning out. There's there's no competition from the men's tournament on Monday night. The the, the men's final four. We set the regional finals in today, and uh, yeah, I think it'll be very, very. I think it'll be a very big number. I, if it was nine point nine million last year, at least half that. You know, at least five million people. I think are going to watch. I don't, I don't know if seven million is a, is a accurate prediction, but uh, I think it's going to be a lot. It must be a lot. Yeah, I think I think we'd be remiss um, if we didn't mention the other game that night, the other game on Monday night. U- UConn's playing USC. It must be Paige Becker. Oh, 100%. Andrew Watkins. And that's yeah. going to be fun as well. So there's, you know, there's a ton of star power on, on the women's side right now. A lot, lots of star players. Um, and they're all playing Monday night. You know, all four of them are, are really, they're, they're going to go after Monday night. It's going to be really fun to watch. Um, so if you're you know, if you're an LSU fan or just a basketball fan in general, I would recommend you watch both games, you know, because you'll really see um, exactly, you know, what kind of star power the women's game has to offer because those girls can play all, all four of them. They're all, they're all, really all stars. Yeah. Juju certainly put on a show in lifting. She wasn't – she didn't do it single-handedly, but she uh, certainly put on a show as a true freshman leading USC past Baylor, a very, very game effort by Nikki Collins' Baylor basketball team. Uh, Rab, I will uh, – I will. Uh, Reed, of course, you're the beat writer, so I won't I won't stick it to you here, but I will stick it to you, Rab. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> no problem. That's what I'm here for. Uh, we uh, we uh, we've we've got a we've got a we've got a a much ballyhooed heavyweight fight. Another one coming up here down the line. This is something that everybody's been waiting for. Uh, in addition to LSU versus South Carolina, this is I mean this is these this is these are the two headline teams. There's just no doubt about it. And so uh, with that in mind, what happens on Monday? And then I, uh, after what happens on Monday between LSU and Iowa, whom do you expect to see in the final four in all four regions? Okay. Um, I will say, you know, I, I went, into the, went into the regional thinking that the UCLA game for LSU was a lot like the Utah game last year in the Sweet 16. And that was LSU's closest game. And we've talked Proved several times on this, we talked several times on this podcast. LSU has had a little good fortune to get past uh, yeah, Utah in that game. They won by three. The closest game of the entire tournament, including the, the, the game in the Final Four with Virginia Tech and the National Championship game, which LSU won by 17. Um, I, I, maybe it's because LSU beat Iowa by 17 last year. I, I just I, I feel better about LSU's chances against Iowa than I did against UCLA. And not that I thought they would lose against UCLA. I thought it would be a very close game that would go down to the wire. And, of course, LSU hit that 14-2 to run at the end of the game and, and pulled away, making a lot of free throws and getting some key defensive stops. Um, I just think, you know, we're talking about the two star players. Caitlin Clark is a great player. Angel Reese has a better supporting cast by far. Uh, and uh, not that they don't have some good players like Gabby Marshall and, and, and some other good, good players for, for Iowa. But I just think LSU, especially the way Flaw J. Johnson is playing, has, has a better supporting cast. I, I, I agree with what Reed said earlier. Hey, Caitlin's, Caitlin's going to score her points. If she gets 30, 35, that's fine. You can't let her get everyone else involved in the offense. She's had five NCAA tournament games. Yesterday was her fifth NCAA tournament game. She had over 25 points and over 15, re- 15 assists, believe it or not. She had 15 assists yesterday. And three of the four games they lost this year, Iowa, she had single-digit assists. So I think LSU's got to keep her from getting everyone else involved in the offense as much. And LSU's very good at getting in the passing lanes, stealing, making steals, yeah, disrupting your offense that way. So they've got to, they've got to do that tomorrow. Not that LSU can't lose, certainly not. Kaylin Clark can take over a game, but I think uh, I think she's a little, they call her ponytail Pete, and there's been a lot of allusions to Pete Maravich. I think she's a little like Pete Maravich in this game. She's the great player, but the four, the four supporting players are not quite as good as the players on the other side for LSU. So uh, I like LSU to, to cut down the nets again at Iowa's expense and, and get back to the Final Four, who I think is going to make the Final Four. Uh, I think uh, South Carolina, yeah, I, I think South Carolina will beat Oregon State here today. Um, and we'll find out, uh, obviously, what, 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 if I'm proven right. Uh, I think UConn is going to win. And then uh, this uh, is the other final is, um, uh, I, I guess I want to say, I guess I want to say Texas, but I'm not, I'm not exactly, not, you know, Texas had a big Not saying it with conviction. Yeah. Not saying it with conviction. No, I, I'm not. So, but I'll, 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 I'll say Texas. I, I think, I think uh, Vic Schaefer's a really good coach and, and uh, 
obviously they're going to be a, a, a lot for everybody to deal with in the SEC uh, starting next year. Uh, Reed, in closing, anything uh, that you say, you know, let's just let's just play this thing out and say uh, LSU and Iowa are going at it in the first quarter. Uh, if the game is going a certain way, what will that tell you? Anything you want to, you know, things that, that, that the average viewer should be looking for who maybe is just now starting to peek in on the LSU women. Things that you want to, if you're watching this game in the first quarter and things are going well for LSU to start off, what will have happened? Iowa will have missed their three-pointers or missed a line share of them, I think. Um, I think if, if Iowa starts out, um, hops in three-point range, LSU is in big trouble. Um, first thing I would watch for is how LSU chooses to defend um, screen and roll actions with Caitlin Clark. Uh, I think that'll tell you a lot about their strategy and a lot about how they're really trying to approach um, the game and how they're trying to keep, you know, Caitlin Clark's teammates from, from beating, beating them. So, yeah, watch how watch how LSU defends Caitlin Clark's screen and rolls. Watch how active Anissa Moro um, is. I, I like Rab's point about how LSU is good about um, getting steals, getting the passing lanes, getting deflections. Anissa Moro is, is probably the best um, LSU player in that regard. She's she can really hang with you know larger post players down low in the paint, and she can get out on the perimeter and, and disrupt things, guard guards, you know, um, get steals, um, we'll do stuff like that. So so Anissa Moro is a player who can switch out on the Caitlin Clark if they want to, or, or they can keep or they can keep you know Flaje Johnson or Haley Van Lith or Lasker Poa um, on Caitlin Clark. So it'll be interesting to see you know what kind of game plan they have. Um, it all starts with those screen and rolls, you know, with Caitlin Clark up top. Um, you know, watch those, watch how LSU defends them, and that'll tell you a lot about, um, you know, how they want to defend Iowa. LSU and Iowa, 6.15 p.m. Monday on ESPN. The rematch is here. It, it should be a blockbuster, uh, depending on where you shop. Iowa is a one-and-a-half-point favorite. The total is 169, and if you're not any good at math, that's uh, that means that you're talking about two teams that the suggested final score would be somewhere in the 80s for both of those teams, and uh, that's not surprising given the fact that uh, Iowa is the leading scoring team in the nation, 91.9 points per game. LSU is the third leading scoring team in the nation at 85.9 points per game. It ought to be a real show. Uh, gentlemen, we appreciate uh, we appreciate you coming in on a Sunday, going crawfish less on a Sunday in Albany, New York, uh, d- 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 doing uh, doing a, a bang up job as usual uh, on what's been a very very eventful weekend. Uh, just so uh, just a, a little bit of business to close out. Of course, uh, we are typically here on Mondays and Thursdays. We wanted to get out in front of this game, obviously a little bit and uh, talk about it and let uh, all our viewers and readers uh, get as much of it as they can uh, before tip-off. So uh, generally speaking, though, we're here on Mondays and Thursdays on the LSU Sports Insider. Uh, we, uh, we uh, of course, we would love for you to join us uh, on all our social channels, specifically the YouTube channel, LSU Tigers on NOAA.com. You can catch us there live. If you don't catch us live after the fact, just go to YouTube and search for LSU Tigers on NOAA.com and follow along there. Uh, please subscribe to The Advocate if you have not already. Uh, go to theadvocate.com slash subscribe to do that and stay up to date with everything, not just LSU women's basketball, but everything with spring football, softball, baseball, such as it is, gymnastics, and everything else. Uh, stay up to date and get our newsletter delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up at theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. Uh, if you don't catch us uh, on YouTube, you can catch us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever other finer podcasts are found. And wherever you catch us, uh, you are going to catch us because you uh, we have been brought to you by Champion Wealth Strategies. Champion Wealth Strategies is a national financial services firm specializing in the capital markets, securities, insurance, 401ks, and college and retirement planning. Broker dealer is LPL Financial Member FINRA, SIPC. As you know, investments are not FDIC insured, may lose value, and have no bank guarantee. Contact Champion Wealth Strategies at championwealthstrategies.com and plan like a champion today. Gentlemen, please enjoy uh, your Easter, such as it is, uh, and have a uh, have a uh, have a cold one wherever you are uh, in a cold in a cold part of the country in Albany, New York, right now. Uh, it's going to be quite a show. We appreciate all the hard work you guys have done on what was a long, long Saturday uh, with everything that happened on Saturday. And there's there's sure to be more fireworks to come because why wouldn't there be? Uh, so uh, gentlemen we appreciate it please uh, get a good night's sleep and we will see you on the other side 
Reed Darcy, we appreciate it. Scott Rabelais, we appreciate it. To every, uh, all of you listeners and viewers out there, happy Easter for those who celebrate. I'm Perrin Keys. This has been the LSU Sports Insider. <laughs>